Okay, it's just slightly before uh, two o'clock, but I think everybody is here. The recording for this session has started, so I'm going to open this afternoon's um, hearing session into the examination of the Maidstone Borough Local Plan Review. Uh, for those who haven't attended previous sessions, just to introduce myself, my name's David Spencer. I'm the Planning Inspector appointed by the Secretary of State to carry out an independent um, examination of the submitted Maidstone uh, Borough Local Plan Review, which the Council uh, submitted in March of last year. Uh, can I check that everybody can hear me okay? Yep, good. Um, can I ask people to please ensure that mobile phones are switched off or on silent settings, please? Uh, and I don't think we do a fire test today, but if an alarm does go off, Mr Edgerton, will you advise us what we need to do, please? Thank you, sir. Yes, um, we're not expecting a fire alarm this afternoon, sir. So um, if the fire alarm does go off, please um, uh, go down the stairs, exit this, this room, to go down the stairs, through the foyer, and assemble on the square and await further instructions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as I outlined a moment ago, these sessions are being um, recorded for those who are either unable to attend or just wish to uh, observe proceedings uh, from home. Um, so that's something that will be taking place, but to help that process and to enable everybody else in the room, if people could please use microphones when uh, making points to the hearing, that would uh, enable everybody um, to be heard. Only people who are seated around the table have the, and who have made representations on the plan and have want to exercise their right to be heard will be heard. So it's, it's um, the hearings are intended to be a uh, an informal but structured discussion based around um, the various questions that I've raised from my reading of your uh, original representations on the plan back in the uh, autumn of 2021, together with your further uh, statements that you've provided into the, uh, the examination. There's no need to read those out to me or um, if people can take them as read and we'll have a, a discussion around uh, the soundness of what is being proposed uh, in the local plan review um, for head corn. It would probably <coughs> certainly help me and probably everybody else in this room if I, if I could just ask people to in briefly introduce themselves, so again using the microphone so that I know who's here and um, people uh, observing the recording know who's potentially uh, participating. So can I start on my right with the Council's team, please? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I'm Megan Thomas, King's Council, promoting the plan for the Local Planning Authority. Thank you, sir. Phil Coyne, Interim Director for the Local Plan Review at Maidstone. Mark Edgerson, Strategic Planning Manager for Maidstone. Gareth Elphick from Stantec on transport, representing NBC if necessary. Good afternoon, sir. Helen Smith, Principal Planning Officer from Maidstone Borough Council. Apologies, sir. Um, Austin Mackey, Major Projects Manager here for these site-specific matters. And then moving around from my right at the back of the table. Good afternoon, sir. Guy Dixon, Planning Director at Savills. Uh, representing Catesby Estates, who are the promoters of the land at Motor Road. Is it possible you can, is that, is that your nameplate in front of it, if it's the other way around? So, yep, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Apologies, sir. Good start. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Philippa Robinson from Savills, um, also with Guy, representing Catesby Estates. Good afternoon, sir. Brendan Wright, representing Kent County Council as Local Highway Authority. Good afternoon. Um, oh, that one. Good afternoon. Claire Weeks, um, also representing Kent County Council as the Highway Authority. Good afternoon. Jonathan Buckwell, DHA Planning, on behalf of Appin Land. Julie Davis from CPRE Kent, the Countryside Charity. Hi, Stephen Christodoulou from Hickon Parish Council. Okay, thank you. Well, 
This afternoon's session, as I say, is going to focus in uh, on head corn, which is, I think everybody around the table will be aware is identified in the local plan review as one of the six uh, rural uh, service centres, all of which are proposed to take uh, a quantum of growth over the plan period through additional um, land releases. I'm going to start first by looking at policy LPR SP6C, which is the Rural Service Centre policy um, for uh, head corn. Uh, and I'd just like to start by inviting the council in the first instance to explain why the policy is set out would be a justified and effective approach uh, for releasing additional uh, land in head corn uh, and to in setting out the infrastructure requirements in that settlement uh, over the plan period, please. Thank you, sir. The development uh, is, is not new to Head Corn. Head Corn has been subject to uh, site allocations uh, and development um, as part, for example, of the local plan 2017. Um, you will see from page 80 of the Regulation 19 document that there are site allocations uh, that have already uh, either been built out or, or, or uh, allocated as part of the 2017 plan. Most of our council is mindful of the fact that whilst Headcorn does have um, significant amounts of facilities and services, which I'll come on to, uh, it has been subject to that development already. And so uh, we have sought as part of our spatial strategy, which you've considered in the stage one hearings, to um, keep development in Headcorn to uh, a, a minimal level, uh, acknowledging that fact. And so we are proposing so, uh, one additional site, uh, SA310, at Moat Road, uh, to reflect that circumstance. Um, the site itself um, is um, uh, in the region of 110 uh, units proposed in, in the plan, um, and uh, that is commensurate to uh, and synergizes with other rural service centres um, uh, at this stage, which we have, have considered. The designation of Head Corn um, as, a, as a rural service centre is consistent uh, with the approach we've taken previously, but is in fact um, also part of uh, new evidence that is supporting this plan where we have updated our settlement hierarchy with reference to LPR 1.11, uh, the settlement, settlement hierarchy review. Within that hierarchy, having regard to connectivity, uh, economy, facilities and scale, Headcorn performs very well indeed as a rural, rural service centre uh, and fits nicely to uh, within that bracket. Uh, so, so we have not only considered the settlement hierarchy here, we've undertaken uh, a robust assessment of sites which have been put forward um, and uh, they have been scored and uh, checked against various designations and criteria as part of our strategic land availability assessment and we've also uh, ensured that appropriate sustainability appraisal per the stage one hearings has taken place. The evidence that we have submitted uh, supports the addition of further growth to Headcorn uh, as a result of the facilities, services and infrastructure which is available, um, including the mainline uh, train station. Um, and we would therefore commend Headcorn for, for this degree of growth, notwithstanding the fact that it has already been subject to it previously. The site which we have chosen um, has passed the sustainability appraisal and also um, the strategic land availability assessment which has been applied consistently uh, across the borough. Uh, we've considered the designation, uh, uh, designations and other issues that could be affected and we have inserted relevant criteria into the policy to ensure that those can be mitigated and taken into account at planning application stage. I just uh, refer, sir, that, uh, to the fact that there are main modifications associated with this which we have proposed to you. Uh, they are contained within sub-011 and also within our response as well um, to the MIQs, the stage two MIQs, there is an additional change. Um, primarily, sir, these are clarification matters um, and uh, there is an addition as well to recognise the proximity of the River Belt as well um, uh, and its triple SI status. But we commend this site and uh, the development in Headcorn to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edgerton. In terms of the, the changes that the Council is identifying for the policy, I think the first um, one you referred to, alluded to, as I understand it, this is a factual update. Is it in terms of one of the 2017 local plan allocations now 
being delivered. That's absolutely correct, sir. Yes, so H138 uh, has now been delivered. Uh, that leaves uh, the residual for H136 as well as the new allocation uh, SA310. Um, our proposal is simply to, to acknowledge that fact um, and therefore alter the numbers accordingly that's being proposed in, in that number point one uh, of policy SP6C. We'd also refer, sir, to point three of that policy. Um, which also refers to the same allocations and we'd also uh, like to delete H138 purely as a matter of fact from that reference as well. Thank you and in terms of the, the other main modification that was um, you outlined I think this is in response to the submissions is it from the Environment Agency in terms of a reference to, to say the proximity of the River Belt Triple SI and the, the importance of um, supporting the conservation objectives for that habitat. That's absolutely right, sir. Yes, we, we've worked closely with the Environment Agency uh, during the preparation of this plan, and they did provide us with comments uh, at Regulation 19 stage, uh, which we uh, are very pleased to incorporate just to ensure that regard is had to the SSSI status uh, of the river belt and its uh, associated conservation. This is something, sir, which isn't specific to Headcorn. We've applied this to other areas as well in accordance with the request from the Environment Agency. Thank you. Now, I should have said it at the start, uh, what I'll do is I'll try and bring people in on kind of relevant um, points. If you've heard something and the, it's, you think that's really important, I need to respond to that. The convention would be to, if you up, 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 append your nameplate, that will signal to me you, you wish to make a point, and I'll, I'll try and bring you in uh, at the relevant point on the discussion. But in terms of the general approach, um, that's being proposed to head corn uh, and the broad level of growth that's um, being envisaged for the for the uh, for the village in particular the addition of 100, well, originally 100 now 110 um, new dwellings uh, perhaps I can hear from others in terms of the soundness or the appropriateness of that approach I know that's an opportunity to bring in mr is it mr Christa, Christa Dulu? For, for the parish council in terms of the submissions you've made on behalf of your community. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think the main problem with it is um, our community has a lot of worries about the fact that the area leading into the site does flood and the area is just adjacent to um, many of the rivers and um, streams that come down off the Green Sand Ridge converge there at that particular point, um, which consequently means that it has very sort of high floods at various times, which means access and entry to the site, um, access and exit from the site, at times of flooding would be very difficult to, um, to manage. Whilst I'm not saying that we don't want the development or anything like that, I think more care needs to be taken about how the development is organised on the site and how entry and exit, exit from the site would be achieved if it floods. I know that there's the 100 the year um, thing about um, it doesn't happen very often etc but it does happen fairly often um, and would render anybody living on that site completely cut off from the village except by foot and the stated exit in times of flooding would be at the top end of the site which means you would have to walk up through the site back down the main road and then into the village which if you have um, older people on the site would be very difficult for them because you'd be going uphill and then uphill come back again as well um, it's not particularly near any um, transport except by walking to the middle of the village it's at the opposite end of the village from the train station so the connectivity isn't that great either um, it's assumed that many of these people living here would be transporting themselves by car, which means you have a lot of traffic coming out of um, what is effectively at the moment a minor country lane onto um, a busy crossroads, uh, onto a busy main road. It would be very difficult to get a, a significant volume of traffic off and back in again at the times of day when people are going to work and coming back from work. Um, we feel that 
amongst the problems is the fact that the, the amount of people that you would have there, the demographic of our village is changing significantly. So whilst they're saying the infrastructure is sufficient, actually the infrastructure of our village is insufficient now. So um, there needs to be a lot more work done to improve uh, the infrastructure within our village to make this a viable site, um, not least of which is childcare. We have no nursery in the village. Um, so you're proposing to add 110 families, potentially, who will potentially have young children who will have nowhere to take them except outside the village. Um, now, in all fairness to Catesby, they have been very receptive to these problems that we've brought their way and said, you know, you need to be able to answer these questions for us to support it. Um, and they have done some bits, um, but the, the fact remains that they are selling on to a developer who, you know, may decide to change all the plans and all the rest of it. So we feel that there's not... It, it's, it's kind of like the, the wrong thing in the wrong place, in a sense, really. It's the top half of the site would probably be okay for development, but the bottom half of the site would exasperate um, flooding in the area and cause people living there um, potentially real problems. Because although the flood mitigation there is proposing to put in of catchment areas, um, basically big tanks, um, they will fill and then once that capacity is reached, it will flood anyway. So you'd only need, um, and the, the funny thing about our place is that you don't need to have the heavy rain or whatever on Headcorn. You can have heavy, heavy rain at the Greensand Ridge and we flood. So a lot of work needs to be done to make sure that the flood risks are mitigated, that people aren't then left stranded in the middle of nowhere. And if there was an emergency requiring uh, fire or ambulance at the time of a flood, whether these things could still reach the, the site. Um, there's probably other things as well, but that's what I can think of. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. We'll come on shortly to talk about the site specifically in, in more detail. I think what I was kind of also keen to hear from, from, the, from the Parish Council, we just heard a moment ago from the Borough Council, they've done an assessment of the various sites that have been put forward in Headcorn. Going through that assessment, um, they consider that the Moat Road site is a deliverable um, achievable and, and suitable site that can help meet um, the, the housing need um, within the borough. Obviously, I'm aware the Parish Council has got specific concerns about this site. Are they concerns that extend to the point where this isn't the site that should be allocated and alternatives should be looked at? Or is the principle of just one site for headcorn acceptable or should it be dispersed in into smaller sites um basically we would prefer um more smaller developments so the 110 houses is not really an issue if you've divided it into um four different uh settlements of 25 or so houses spread amongst uh the more it's hard to say obviously our village is bounded by the railway so it can't extend um to the south the only extension point really is north and north-west. Uh, um, those are really where it needs to expand to provide um, safe, suitable accommodation. Expanding to the east will brings you into the floodplain of the River Gilt, and expanding to the west is impossible because it's got the railway line in the, in the, in the way, as well as a floodplain. Um, so I, mean, I would say, in all fairness, the, t the top half of that site is probably okay because it goes uphill. So half of the site probably would be fine, the, the northern half of it. Um, but generally speaking, I think development would be better pushed into the north and northwest quadrants of the village if, 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 we, I said, if we have to have the amount of development that is um, mandated by government, etc. Um, I think it's also important to note that we are getting... We need to have a look at the type of housing that we're receiving as well, um, because we're getting a lot of sort of quite expensive houses um, and quite a lot of social housing. And really what we need is um, low cost, small housing, one and two bedroom houses or apartments or whatever, 
to give people in the village a place to step up onto to get onto the housing ladder, um, which would be better placed towards the north and northwest of the village, I think, than on this area, if that makes sense. Thank you. And we'll come back to the detail of the moat, the moat road site in, in, in due course. But if I can hear from others in terms of the, the principle of the, the approach that the council's taking um, in relation to, to headcorn, perhaps more widely, it's, it's approach to kind of site selection as so it's going for one single site allocation of hundreds, well, now 110 um, dwellings. Um, Ms. Davis next for CPRE, Kent and Mr. Buckwell, and then Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Um, I'm in slight danger of waving into your next question, so stop me if you feel I'm going too far. So um, CPRE Kent is concerned about the what we perceive as being overdevelopment of a village on this single site and feel that the mitigations to be overcome in terms of the, the flooding and um, directing development towards the northern end of the site is just a, a, a significant, it signifies the fact that it isn't the right site to be developed. Um, and the extent of the mitigations that are required to overcome that, we then, you know, know there's the offer of the, the landscape buffer, but whether that's going to look contrived in the landscape. And when you approach the village from this side, from the staple host direction, you, you know, it's a very charming drive through to the village and it's a hedge lined road and then brings in concerns um, with the um, creation of the access and the visibility space and um, how that's going to be approached. And as you come to the village, it's not really until you get over the little bridge and you, the road wiggles and we've got the listed farmhouse to the side that you actually sort of arrive, you feel that you've arrived in the village proper with the crossroads and the church to the side and then you bend down to the high street itself. So it, it sort of comes from that sort of uh, the, the strategic site, I don't know the site as well as um, my colleague here from the parish council, but it was just the feeling that this is an overdevelopment and therefore isn't appropriate. And if you were looking for a modification for us to suggest, it would be that the site be deleted. And um, as you know, our preference from earlier sessions is that density is increased in Maidstone to compensate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Buckwell, please. Yeah, so I won't repeat all the points that we made in, in the previous hearing sessions, but uh, as you all know, we had concerns about the settlement hierarchy and in, in the fact that uh, the, the proposed garden villages are being placed above rural service centres in, in the hierarchy um, when the rural service centres are already sustainable uh, development locations um, where rather than something that may be sustainable in 20 or 30 years' time but isn't yet. Um, so that's a very good reason we think over the over the plan period to be to be looking to make the most of sustainable locations such as rural service centres. Headcorn is very clearly a sustainable location for development. Um, I think it's important that there is a mix of sites brought forward um, in in places like uh, Headcorn. Um, I won't go into uh, the details of you all know we've got concerns over over the moat road site um it, it clearly is notwithstanding what's being said uh in some other places it, it is clearly a constrained site which has some significant issues um and it what we're struggling to understand is exactly how um the council have you know they, they, they say they've done a lot of detailed analysis and gone through the schla um, and, and come to the conclusion that, that that site is the best one to allocate in uh, head corn yet um, even in the, the schlar itself in the in the detailed write-up for, for moat road it, it, it said that the site was unsuitable on on access grounds um, whereas my client's land um, was was you know, was was found to be suitable and, and available for development and has the potential to to bring forward other benefits as well so this is uh, my client's land is one of the the sites that is in the north of the village um it is much less constrained um by by flood risk in the the, the access um onto the existing road network is is not far a, a flood zone and there's the potential to create um, a link road across the the north um northern parts of, to, to begin that road um, which will help to relieve 
junctions that are already under pressure um, in, in the centre of the village. So there's, there's community benefits there um, and also from the improved sports facilities that we're proposing um, and, and other you know, the, the, the range of, of housing. You, as you've heard, it's important that there is a range of housing and as well as um, starter homes, um, it's important to be providing sufficient elderly specialist uh, housing for the elderly as well, which is something that we were proposing here. Um, so we are not clear at all um, that that the council has gone through the the, the proper processes in, in in looking at the sites. Um, relying on one site really does mean every, every, every box has to be ticked on on that site. There has been a planning application in on on the Moat Road site, which has had to be withdrawn um, due to uh, concerns, um, not not least about access. Um, so yeah, we, we have a number of concerns there. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll bring in Mr. Dixon next and then Mr. Wright. Thank you, sir. Uh, as, as you probably might expect, we uh, support the council's approach. Uh, we believe by definition Headcorn is a sustainable location for, for this quantum of development. Um, in fact, as you'll have seen in our representations, we actually believe the site is readily uh, uh, able to accommodate additional units. We think 110 is still a very conservative figure. Um, the key benefit I wanted to highlight in terms of the strategic approach of allocating one larger site is that you will have certainty over delivery of a, a greater quantum of affordable housing as part of the scheme because clearly with a number of smaller sites, then the, the proportion of affordable housing being delivered from those will inherently be reduced. So I just wanted to highlight that benefit, sir. Um, obviously, a number of site specifics have been identified, but I'm assuming we'll come back to those in the, in the, the later discussions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wright, please. Thank you, sir. The County Council's concern is a matter of highway safety, uh, having regard to paragraph 110 of the MPPF, which requires that sites have safe and suitable access for all users. Um, our concern really is that there, there are constraints that exist on Moat Road um, that will um, prevent it from being made suitable and safe for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, which is a, a requirement of the, the Moat Road site policy. So in our view, that, that is a matter of soundness. Thank you. Yes, we'll come on to some of the specifics about uh, the Moat Road site, but we may come back to this in terms of just the general site selection ap uh, approach for, for head Headcorn. But before I come back to the council, Mr. Christodoulou. Thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, which site the gentleman three down, Jonathan Buckwell, was representing? Yes, Mr. Buckwell. It, it, it's, it's the land that's being promoted by Appin Land um, to the north of the Bowls Club. Obviously some excitement uh, in Maidstone this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> if I can turn to the Borough Council, in terms of the site um, selection process, and notwithstanding some of the detail we'll come on to in relation to the Moat Road site. Uh, in terms of identifying this as the, the single sort of direction and single site for, for the village, uh, and in particular the point raised by Mr. Buckwell uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Appian land, as to whether the evidence base, and in particular the Schla does support an evidence that this is an appropriate uh, and deliverable site or whether there were known sort of fund fundamental issues, particularly around uh, access or highway that were and may remain insurmountable. Thank you, sir. Yes, I'm very pleased to say that um, uh, the SLAR um, 
Yes, it does certainly acknowledge the access issue. Um, it's, it has considered a large number of other factors as well. Um, and uh, it, it, it has considered the sites on a consistent basis overall. Um, the access issue itself is not insurmountable, sir. Um, there are ways of, uh, that, that we can accommodate the access. Um, the other factor which was, uh, has been raised as well generally is the principle of this site in terms of flood risk, sir. I think it's important we should get to the bottom of that as well. I know we'll go on to further detail, but the, in principle, the allocation of this site, we, we've considered views of the Environment Agency, we've considered flood risk and consulted around flood risk overall. Um, so it's only the very bottom part of this site that is within flood zone two and three. Um, the rest of the site is, is, is not within that, it's uh, within flood zone one. Um, and that actually corresponds with some of the access uh, as well. So they're actually two very related issues. Um, and as I say, that's not insurmountable. So um, actually the site has scored very well indeed from that point of view. Uh, our sustainability appraisal acknowledged the flooding issue and, uh, and has also acknowledged the, the fact that it scores very highly in, in many other respects as well. So um, from a local authority point of view, um, there was nothing to exclude this site at all from being a green site. It is uh, seen to be entirely uh, de deliverable, developable um, and achievable um, and uh, we, we would certainly commend it um, to you, sir. Um, the, there are a large number of other sites which have been put forward in Headcorn and I think it's important to note that um, you know, we have sought with our spatial strategy to focus growth onto other areas this time round, given the amount of uh, land that has been uh, developed within Headcorn and other uh, areas of the countryside. Um, this is a residual amount to uh, keep the, the sort of the, the prosperity of the of, of the rural community and so forth, uh, and a small amount of development. There are other green sites, sir. Um, however, there is no onus on the council to ensure that uh, other green sites are, are included just because they exist. Um, we are perfectly happy with this site. It is adjacent to the existing settlement boundary and will be incorporated within it. Um, the principle of developing in this settlement is, is already understood and is not disputed. Um, and, and so, sir, given the criteria from the SLA, the sustainability appraisal, um, and the fact that the access flooding issue is not insurmountable in, in any stretch of the imagination, we believe that it is entirely appropriate to include it within the plan. Thank you. And in terms of, I mean, the SLA process and, and the SA process, um, things are not always uh, um, unanimous in terms of um, very against the various kind of criteria. There can be pluses as well as negatives and unknowns and um, etc. I mean, are there any particular positives uh, in relation to this um, this moat road location or this this sort of direction of of growth? I mean, I've, I've heard from the, the parish council in terms of the potential barrier of the railway issues around the river belt, but are there, were there other sort of posit positives that kind of led the council to uh, include or assess this site, Mr. Mackey? Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll come in with my usual layer of detail. Um, on the point firstly made by the parish council about the preference for a series of smaller sites, um, we were not presented with a series of smaller sites, so that wasn't a choice through the call for sites. Um, there was one smallish site next to Grig Lane, but that received windfall planning permission, so ruled itself out by um, being ahead of the site allocation process. There were two other green sites to the east of the village, um, effectively acting as an extension of the 2017 sites. Um, when I took over the site process from a colleague leading it at the time, the feedback was that it was the parish council themselves that didn't want to continue the eastward growth and we were therefore steered um, in an alternative direction. Um, the site that Mr Buckwell's client is promoting is significantly further north, it's effectively going out of the village um, and therefore it's, it's further away from services, it's much much larger 
than the application site. Um, so that, that wouldn't have met the parish council's criterion. Um, so this site seemed to be a natural balancing, as we've done in other towns, of taking a slightly different direction for growth. It's, it's not detached from the village, it's adjacent to an established area of housing immediately to the east. To the north of it is the Bovis site that I suspect is, is completed by now, if not it's very, very close. Um, so in a way it infills that end of the village, um, but it's equally distant from the other green sites um, to the train station. We tested these in detail. I, I tested each of the green slar sites in terms of station, doctors, etc, etc, with the exception of the doctors, because the surgery is on that side of the village. It was almost neck and neck on every single criterion in terms of proximity and sustainability. Um, the Appin land site is red, so it didn't even get through that stage of the SLA for reasons of distance, um, not wedding to the existing form of the village. And the same with the Kitewood land to the northwest of Mainstone Road. So the parish council say their preference is north and northwest. Well, we're we're, we're in we're in the northwest direction from the centre of the village. Um, if you go any further north than us, you are really going out of the village and heading towards um, Sutton Valence. Um, so our view is that this site offered an opportunity to sustainably link back into the site. It has the pedestrian connection to the north as well as the moat road access. So in, in terms of the choice available through the call for sites process, um, it was considered to be a site that had equal merit to the other green sites. And, and the green site promoted by, uh, I can't remember their name, but the, the excluded site, the omitted site um, to the northeast of the village, um, they have a significantly greater proportion of their site covered by flood zones two and three. There aren't many sites in the southern part of the village that escape the flood zone, probably only Mr. Buckwell's site, but that lacks other qualities in terms of accessibility and sustainability. So we feel that it was a, a, a reasonable choice to pursue in terms of the relationship to the existing village and past growth. Thank you. I'll bring in others. I hear from Mr. Buckwell next and then Mr. Christodoulou. Uh, yeah, I'm slightly surprised by that um, last comment from, from Mr. Mackey about the Appin site being a red site because I'm looking at the Schla right now and it's clearly in the green table on, on page 23, so I'm not quite sure um, where that's coming from. And also on the detailed site assessment, it clearly shows that it is it is suitable and available for, for development. Um, on the the Moat Road site, you're just going back to the point on, on, on the Schla again, you're effectively being told by the council not to worry about the access issue because it, it, it's uh, it's resolvable. I mean, just to give you the direct quote from, from the council's Schlar on this, the site is recommended as unsuitable on access grounds due to the requirement for third party land in order to achieve suitable access to the, uh, to the primary highways network. Um, as you'll be aware, that there was a, an outline planning application submitted on that site following um, following a lot of discussions, um, and that had to be withdrawn a few weeks ago um, because of an objection uh, uh, from Kent County Council, um, particularly on access grounds, amongst other things. You've heard this afternoon Kent County Council telling you that they are very concerned about the access to this site. So quite where we're getting this reassurance that everything's okay, um, I'm struggling to follow. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll probably come on to that a bit more when we look at the site-specific policy, but if I hear next from Mr Chris Dooley and then I'll come back to Mr Dixon. Um, hi, yeah. Um, it feels to me that the council, having changed in the last few years, we literally had all new councillors come in and so whatever the old council said should be not taken as the approved way forward for the new council so the old council were extremely anti-development uh, of the village the new council is not anti-development of the village they just wish the development to be in the right places in the right amounts basically um, so I can understand 
where Mr. Mackey's coming from, given that he's working from old information, but no one has come to us and asked us for our opinion now, despite the council having been changed for several years and the previous council uh, information he has being from six years ago. Um, also, yeah, I'm, I have seen the plans for the site um, near the bowl, uh, near the up the road. Um, it would seem to me that anywhere that you built in the village now would be on the very boundary of being within the distance of the centre of the village, um, which would make any site on the edge of the village as viable as any other site. However, other sites towards the upper part, going on along the Maidstone Road, for instance, out of Headcorn, or into the countryside towards the north uh, west, um, would be sorry, northeast, sorry, my mistake, northeast would be better than going towards the the uh, the moat road development because the road there is very narrow. Um, so the chances of being able to make the road and the old bridge that's there larger to accommodate foot traffic and car traffic, because it's literally the, the, the road narrows down to a single lane bridge. It has no room on it to put a pedestrian walkway. So the bottom half of their site would be very difficult to deliver um, as connective to the to, to the to the to the village. Um, I, th I think it's it's it would be very hard to to get past these obstacles, which seems to be what the people in charge of the highway seem to think as well. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Next, please. So, really, just a question. I mean, we're obviously straying into a lot of site specifics, which we're very happy to respond to. Um, I was obviously holding my fire on that, and I'll continue to do so if you're happy. But I'm, I'm happy to clarify the context of the withdrawn planning application at any stage. Um, I didn't know when that was appropriate for me to do so. so. We'll probably come on to that in terms of the uh, the site specific. Um, issue. I think what I want to understand from the Borough Council here in terms of just the general approach to site selection and I come back to this uh, the point made by Mr Buckwell in terms of what it is in the SLA and the highway issue and how the council arrived at a kind of a, a conclusion or an assessment that was confident that that, that issue um, could be addressed and what evidence it had to inform that uh, that kind of strategic kind of site uh, assessment uh, stage, Mr. Coyne. So, uh, Mr. Elphick, we'll we'll talk about the the site access and the highways issues, if that's okay. Just in terms of the site selection, Mr. Chris Doddaloo's point. I w I do recall, and uh, Mr. Mackey refers to this. I recall the colleague that had the conversations with the parish council. And the steel was at that time that they thought this site was more suitable because they wanted to sort of balance the, the existing site from the 2017 plan and, and move to the west. And I, I get that there may have been a change in, in members on the parish council, but sadly one of the facts of democracy is that people sometimes inherit things that they themselves may not have done. So uh, if I can hand over to Mr. Elphick, please. Yes, uh, happy to speak now. Obviously, I um, sort of was holding my fire in the same way as Mr. Dixon on whether we're getting into site specifics. So, are we moving on into site specifics? <laughs> I think the two have become sort of slightly entangled in that um, it's difficult to talk about the principle of um, this direction of growth without getting into to some of the detail. I think it's this. It's this point from, uh, say, from Mr. Buckwell about the, the Schlara clearly identifying this as an issue uh, and nonetheless, in light of alternatives that were available, the council has still pursued this site, notwithstanding what appears to be a, a high level um, assessment, kind of um, a recognition or a, an appreciation that there are highway issues in relation to this, this particular site. And I just want to before we get into the kind of some of the, the detail, um, just to understand from the council how it was kind of confident or assured in light of that Schlar um, 
evidence that this site would be would be deliverable, um, particularly from the highways perspective. So I don't know, Mr. Is it Mr. Alfit? Okay, so if I if I try and keep them brief and maybe we revisit as we build up the site specific. So it sounds like sort of two main issues are appearing: the sustainable modes, active modes, the pedestrians and cyclists, and then also this in. Uh, interaction between the transport and the flooding issue. So I think they're the two ones who we'll broadly cover those two points first and then our pause and then we, I assume you want to take reports from others. So yes, obviously normally on a site of a reasonable size, you obviously have your vehicular access and then potentially some form of secondary access, whether it's all vehicular, not in this case, because the site's not big enough or some sort of emergency access which often doubles up as a pedestrian and cyclist one. So obviously already we're overlapping the ones. So if I stick with the pedestrians initially, I'll, I'll just do pedestrians and cyclists as well, being a cyclist, I don't want to dismiss them, but I'll do the pedestrians. So obviously you can have a route that is completely on walkway, but as people have said, that would be a longer route. So ideally some sort of route on moat road would be preferable. And I believe in the previous plan application, but I won't go into details too much, there was a drawing for that showing that a footway can be given for almost the whole route and is just that short pinch point of the bridge where you would then need a pedestrian to be on the roadway. But as Mr Edgerton has said, it's not insurmountable. There are ways you could have to make it a safer environment for pedestrians. And once again, I'll just quit reiterate, if a pedestrian really didn't want to walk on the walkway on the roadway, there is the longer walking route anyway. Uh, as a sort of comparator, there's a village over near Canterbury called Fordwich, which has the same story that most of the footway route to where buses are available on the A28 in Sturry is has a footway and then there's a short bit where the bridge just becomes a point where you have to be in the roadway. But as long as you've designed and put in appropriate mitigations, moving the 30 mile an hour zone, some sort of priority work in all possibilities, probably not for the plan making stage, but can all be considered, we don't see it as insurmountable. So that's the pedestrian side of it. I can leave it at that point for now, I'm trying to keep it brief for now. And then in terms of the overlap between the flooding and transport, uh, so I'm, tr I'm trying to avoid not referring to the fact I'm very, I live very close to the area, so I don't think it floods as much as people say that badly that often. I've, I've cycled through it when it's wet, so cars have clearly gone through it as well. But in an extreme case, you can see, once again, not insurmountable, a way of having a way of opening up the emergency access for vehicles if there are times when the actual main access has got to the point where a car can't drive through it. So I don't think either point is insurmountable and I don't think there are issues for the plan making stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. For bringing in others, Mr Mackey, please. Thank you, sir. Specifically on the, the SLA comments, obviously the SLA identifies potential issues with sites and, and almost triggers the council and promoters and other site promoters to look at whether those issues can be overcome. Um, between, well, from, from the SLA onwards, we've been talking to many site promoters about addressing issues, as, as you would expect, to ensure that the allocation is sound. Um, I've got email correspondence in front of me. The, the site promoters first began a conversation with the Highway Authority in 2019. Um, I have in front of me an email from October um, because obviously in our conversations with them, we, we identified that they needed to address site access if we could continue with the site. Um, the site promoters say we would now like to agree the access arrangements, including the local footway scheme with you. Um, that was to KCC in October um, 2020. Um, in November 2020, KCC's development planner responds I've had the chance to review the proposals and confirm them to be acceptable in principle, but it's caveated that this will be subject to detail being worked up. So whilst the SLA identified a potential issue regarding access, the site promoters had taken this on and given the local authority comfort that this matter you know, could be overcome and therefore we were right to proceed 
with the direction on this site. Thank you, um, Mr. Dixon, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that we were asked to um, provide further details of highways access as part of our discussions with policy officers between the Reg 18 and Reg 19 stage, and we provided details of the, the pre-app meeting that we had, um, first of all, in July 2019, in fact, with Mr. Wright and, and a colleague uh, at that stage. Um, there were no um, objections in principle, yet there were a number of technical matters that need to be clarified, but there were no objections in principle um, about the access. Uh, and in terms of the uh, pedestrian route, uh, we were proposing a new um, footpath, footway, along the side of Moat Road, all the way back into town. That continued across the side of the bridge, so there was no need for pedestrians to actually step into the road. The footway was provided all the way along to link up to the existing footway. And uh, that plan, sir, is before you as part of our, our submissions in our examination statements, part of the appendices. Uh, it's also worth just noting that the uh, because we got to the planning application stage, the access proposals and the pedestrian route was all subject to a highway safety audit, stage one safety audit, which confirmed it was acceptable sir, and safe. Okay. Um, I hear next from Mr. Chris Dooley for the Parish Council, and I think Mr. Edgerton, you want to come in? I hear, I hear from the Parish Council next, please. I, yeah, I can't quite believe that um, reasonable access to a site on a busy main road means walking across a bridge uh, in the road um, where potentially you would have people with children or pushchairs or buggies or whatever you want to call it um, would be just, so, oh, that's all right, you just go walk in the road. Um, I do find that a bit weird. Um, I find it unlikely the bridge has enough space on it to provide a pedestrian walkway beside the road. I mean, there's probably a foot either side of any car going across that bridge, I would think. It's certainly not enough for two cars to pass each other, so I would find it unlikely that there's enough room for, what, 85, 90 centimetres for a, for, a, for a pathway. Um, I think, really, whoever's suggesting this is good enough needs to do better. Mr. Edgerton, please. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, we, we, we've talked a fair amount now about the overall merits of the site, its proximity, uh, services, facilities. Um, the fact it is, you know, e easily rounding off uh, Headcorn, in, in, or would be it's within the western parcel uh, rather than the northern parcel. Um, we know this has various other merits as well. It has the ability to provide the open spaces, has ticked the slar boxes. The, the concern seems to be now focused around the access. That access sir, is uh, associated with the pinch point, which is effectively the bridge um, that, that, that leads um, uh, out. Um, and uh, following conversations with Kent County Council, um, I think if I can turn to Mr. Elphick and, um, and uh, explain, uh, ask Mr. Elphick to explain what the solution would be. And we'd be happy, sir, just to place that into criteria for the policy to ensure comfort for the highway authority in terms of appropriate access uh, to the site in order to 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 get us uh, uh, over this this very issue so i wonder if i could bring in mr elphick for that sir yeah so i won't comment on a scheme drawing that was already in as part of a plan application but obviously i'm sure in that plan application they would have considered what size of footway could be got across the bridge and then to consider is that wide enough is that ideal or with some sort of highway mitigation like i said i don't want to go into specifics because that would be something that would be done in cons consultation with kcc on the kcc highways on the most suitable solution once you got to the plan application stage but a combination of either the speed limit being moved out so you get into the 30 mile an hour zone earlier some sort of what they call psychological calming where you use road markings to slow cars down uh, uh, some sort of priority working these are all possibilities there's many possibilities to work with just to make it a sensible environment and, and sufficiently safe but for that short pinch point if a footway couldn't be provided sufficient width across the bridge that it wouldn't be deemed as an uh, unsafe pedestrian environment and just to return to the point that there is always the alternative footway route that 
albeit longer, would not require anyone who did not like the idea of being on either a narrow footway or potentially being in the roadway for a short period of time to use. So that was always going to be the secondary, a secondary alternative for pedestrians. Thank you. Thank you. So, so just so that I'm clear, is, is the council proposing further policy content because I'm going to look under the section for accessing highways uh, in relation to site 310 it refers to development being subject to uh, provision of acceptable off-site pedestrian and cycle connectivity to the A274 which I think something Kent County Council have said is a, uh, a must for this um, development uh, and then in terms of the design of the new footways is the council saying there's further content that could be added that's absolutely right sir uh, grateful to Kent County Council they submitted evidence um, uh, into this inquiry which was accepted um, and effectively they raised concerns regarding the access issue uh, I had an informal conversation as a result of that um, and um, what Kent County Council are looking for is is some assurance um, that this can be dealt with um, and that we, we you know appropriate solutions could be put in place to ensure the access is sufficient to get over the pinch point issue with the bridge so um, the borough council has absolutely no objection whatsoever to putting in suitable wording uh, to ensure that that pinch point is dealt with to ensure safe pedestrian access uh, as well as vehicular access uh, out of the site in, in that regard so we will be very happy to commend that that to you Thank you. Uh, obviously, words are one thing. It's the kind of the uh, um, assurance that that's that's kind of going to be feasible and and achievable. And I, I appreciate this kind of waters are, are are sort of or matters are blurred here in the fact that there has been at, at some point a concurrent planning application and specific proposals. But I mean, is is a some emerging kind of in principle solution? Um, for Moat Road because it seems to me that this site would be dependent on achieving pedestrian access along Moat Road it cannot sort of wholly rely on a just an alternative uh, more uh, circuitous pedestrian kind of access into into headquarters are we at, or is the examination in a position where there is as I say the kind of the the coalescence or agreement around a kind of an in principle kind of solution for moat road subject to further further work i know this is a particular issue for for the county council so perhaps if i bring in mr wright first then mr dixon then mr mackey and then mr christodoulou for the parish council so mr wright first please Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, th I think in many ways you've you've just hit the nail on the head there in that um, Moat Road is the direct desire line from the site into Headcorn Village and most of its key facilities, which would include the rail station, the shops and the school. Um, the the secondary emergency access is a, is a far more circuitous route via Milbank to those those very facilities. Um, I just wanted to make the point that the, the county, count and county council's acceptance of a scheme in principle um, would have had caveats attached to it. So we would have wanted reassurances around um, land availability, achieving suitable width of footway and satisfactory completion of a stage one road safety audit. Now, those issues ultimately were brought to bear in the planning application that's been referred to. So in commenting on that planning application, um, we actually had concerns over the road safety audit that, that were not resolved at the point it was withdrawn. So um, for us, the situation remains that um, it, it hasn't been demonstrated to our satisfaction um, that pedestrian route can be achieved along Moat Road to serve the site.
Thank you. So I'm going to hear from Mr. Dixon next, please. Thank you, sir. I really just wanted to reiterate that the, um, the, the footway that we have shown on the, uh, the plan that was submitted as part of the examination statement showing that link all the way back into along Moat Road back into the centre of the village is, um, is 1.5 metres in width all the way along um, and that's been subject to, to detail assessment and discussion with, with KCC Highways. Um, so we, we firmly believe that provides a wholly safe um, solution and, and the appropriate pedestrian connectivity uh, back into the village. Um, the other point Sarah wanted to make was that the, the SLA conclusion, the early SLA conclusion was prior to the emergency access being provided to the north and the, the council at that stage did not realise that our clients had full access rights over that track to the north. Um, so that's, that's uh, I think, partly explains that anomaly there in that, in that conclusion. So we have full access rights um, to the north to provide both an emergency access and obviously a permanent um, cycling and pedestrian connectivity to the north. Thank you. Mr Mackey, please. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr Wright is correct that the the County Council have caveated their advice on the site so far and I think we need to be careful about the level of detail that's required for a planning application versus a site allocation. Um, Mr Wright issued a holding objection on the planning application rather than an objection in principle requesting further levels of detail to be provided which to be honest is 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 the case on most major planning applications so this site is not unique in in requiring a number of questions but the highway authorities written advice to the planning authority of March this year in referred to the detailed scheme with regard to the principle of access i.e. the relationship of the site and its connection to the village they say whilst KCC acknowledged that the proposed arrangement would involve reducing traffic to one-way workings, and at this point they mean the pinch point on the bridge. They say that such an arrangement is not dissimilar to other locations within the village, such as the approach from Ulcombe. In addition, a minimum carriageway width of 4.3 metres would be maintained, thereby retaining access for larger vehicles. Um, in relation to the pedestrian connection, they acknowledge the width of 1.5 to 2 metres, their holding comment is that as the footway doesn't reach the bell mouth, how does it link? And the applicant had responded by demonstrating that pedestrians turn into the site before vehicles do. So, again, in the context of a site allocation discussion, I think we have sufficient comfort that both the principle of the site's connection to the village for vehicles and pedestrians is deliverable subject to all of that detail that would normally come out in a subsequent planning application. Thank you. Mr Christodoulou, please. With all due respect, it would need to be completely safe. Um, we have a real problem in our village with the amount of traffic and speeding. Um, the, the, the traffic that could potentially be coming over that bridge won't be doing 30 miles an hour unless you have physical th things in place to stop cars going fast. It will always be a danger, even if you put in a pedestrian um, uh, pavement inside the bridge where the road is. It would need something to make sure cars are only going slowly through that part of the, the road. Um, otherwise, this is the point where y you will be discussing it, but I'm going to have to deal with it for the rest of forever. And I already have people that every time we see them, they're always saying speed is an issue in the village. And I'd rather not have another 110 families telling me that speed is an issue right outside their state. Thank you. Before I sort of bring highway and access to sort of a conclusion, Mr Dick Dixon. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to point out that our recent speed survey showed an average speed of 29 miles an hour at the 85th percentile uh, along that road coming into Headcorn. So and that's recent survey data from this year. Thank you, Mr. Regerton. 
Just one final comment, uh, um, because obviously this is this is a central issue. Um, if there is a main modification required to the policy, notwithstanding what Mr. Mack is saying about the very significant difference between the detail required with a planning application and the site allocation, if there is a, a main modification required to the policy, we'd be happy to accept that. So if that's something which the Highway Authority would, would wish, we, we'd be happy to incorporate it. Thank you. I mean, I think that's ultimately where I was, I was going in terms of concluding on this point, that if the council can prepare a, a main modification for me to consider in relation to <coughs> securing um, access, uh, safe access for all along Moat Road. And does the policy also need to refer to and specify that a secondary point of access will be secured. I mean, I think Mill Bank has, has been identified whether there's now sufficient certainty to specify that in policy as a secondary point, Mr. Mackey. Sir, they are in the policy. For example, the first bullet point. Um, on page 197 of the Reg 19 plan and the penultimate bullet point on 196. But if it would help as part of the main mod, then we could happily beef those up and be far more explicit in terms of emergency access and what would constitute safe pedestrian access. So what, what we'll do is revisit the existing policy in drafting, in drafting the main mod so that we don't get repetition, yeah. I think in terms of the, the point on the emergency access, this may sort of um, cut across the flood risk issue. My understanding is that that would obviously provide a, potentially provide another point of access to the site, uh, given the the, uh, the flood risk, the flood zone three, as it crosses over um, Moat Road. So yeah, I think I think my my ultimate um, advice conclusion on the highway issue is to ask the council to look at some further words by way of the proposed main modification um, in terms of yes, securing the the safe pedestrian continuous safe pedestrian access on along um, Moat Road uh, and emergency and pedestrian access to the north. Mr. Dixon, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Just just a, a couple of points on that. In terms of the access to the north, it's the the, the rights are that we can provide it as an emergency access, but not as a not as a principal point of access. I just wanted to clarify that um, that particular uh, point. Um, I also just wanted to to, to ask uh, the the um, examination statement from KCC Highways only came online probably in the last 24, 48 hours. Um, so we hadn't had an opportunity to, to look at that and consider it in any, any great detail. I wondered whether it would be helpful for you if we were to provide a written response to their examination statement subsequent to the hearings to, to aid the issue. Uh, just just want to say very happy to provide that if that would be of assistance. So, because the, the reason I offer that is because obviously the comments provided there are very different to the comments provided as part of the, the application process. So I just thought that might help provide clarity, but uh, in your hands on that one, sir. I must admit, I'm slightly confused. I've, I've certainly had Kent County Council's statement for some for some time. I wasn't aware there was a lag or any kind of delay of, with online material, Mr. Edgerton. Thank you, sir. Yeah, um, no, we're very happy with uh, the um, comments made by Kent County Council. There is a significant difference between a planning application, obviously, in the level of detail that was required in that respect, and the principles that are required to insert main modifications into the policy criterion. Um, in that regard, I'm very pleased indeed to um, to, to take on board your, your comments. Uh, we'll work with Kent County Council to ensure appropriate wording uh, where that is possible uh, to do so, both to um, 
detail the securing of safe access um, uh, along Moat Road and also the, um, the second point of access, the emergency access um, um, through to Mill Bank as well. Um, there is a difference between the planning application, sir, and, and, and the policy. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with the comments which have been received from Kent County Council, which appear to be entirely reasonable. Thank you. If I can move on to uh, flood risk, um, and I appreciate there may be some slight overlap in terms of, of, of access. Uh, my understanding from reading all the material before me that it is only the well, I say only it is the site access which is the uh, part of this proposed allocation which is in the areas of higher uh, flood risk. Um, In terms of um, the various representations before me, I've obviously heard from the Parish Council earlier in terms of their concern about flood risk um, in this this location are matters wider than um, the issue of access via Moat Road or is the submission that further parts of the site are at risk of flooding or is the and is the concern wider that development on this site will potentially increase the risk of flood flood risk elsewhere in the village? Mr. Christodoulou first, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. The because it's the confluence of several streams coming into uh, that particular area, um, it will make flooding further up uh, those streams. We think worse. Um, the school stream itself comes almost to the road. Um, across the main road, we figure that um, if the flooding there is exasperated, it will increase flooding all the way up School Stream, which will be the main road, the school, the school's grounds, um, two further estates further up the road. It will affect Hogsbridge Green, uh, one of our open spaces, which has houses built beside it, which will also be a problem. Um, it, the belt itself, or built itself, goes off further down towards the air. Um, towards parallel with the rail tracks. It will affect houses at Shenley, um, the airfield perhaps even, and going up back up towards Grid Lane and Lenham. Uh, we, we are, we, that area is a huge catchment area for flood water. Um, the Water Lane is appropriately named, which is just down the road from Moat Road. Moat Road having a particular uh, M-O-A-T, as in the Moat Rounder Castle. It's not called that for nothing. Um, the area beside that road, um, but before the train line, I think, is a floodplain. It floods to a depth of probably a foot or two during heavy rain. It goes completely across the, the uh, roadway to a depth of a couple of feet uh, because the river bursts its banks, goes around the bridge that's there, St Stephen's Bridge, and carries on down towards... Um, or I imagine the Medway. Um, so that the, the ramifications of increasing flooding at that point, even if you don't increase the flooding directly there due to sumps and things, the potential knock-on effect could be quite disastrous for areas both downstream and upstream um, going forward. Thank you. Um I can bring in others on the issue of, of flood risk. Um, bring in Mr. Dixon first, and then I'll come back to, to Mr. Mackey. Mr. Dixon. Thank you, sir. Um, I just wanted to point to the um, the flood map that was in our uh, appendices. I, I don't know if you, you have the pack to hand, sir, but page 500 of our appendices, uh, conveniently, um, it shows the flood map as issued by the Environment Agency. Um, that shows that uh, the access into the site is not within the um, flood zone three or four, um, and also that only uh, less than 4.5% of the site as a whole falls within the the, the floodplain, the, the higher flood zones. Um, and I just wanted to confirm that no development is being proposed in um, in that zone at all, which is is purely in the uh, the southeast corner of the site, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr Mackey, please. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, 
Mr. Dixon is correct. It's a very small proportion of the site. I don't know whether you have access to the flood maps. I've got the benefit of our GIS system here and the, the live map, and it, it shows that flood zone three itself only just sort of ticks the bottom right-hand corner of the site and flood zone two ripples along the road. Um, Mr. Dixon is correct that the site access and the bell mouth are not within that zone, and nor is the vast majority of the, the developable site. Um, you may have seen the indicative drawings submitted by the promoters in their Reg 18, Reg 19 submissions. Um, they don't rely on the southern part of the site for development. They simply provide open space, flood management and, and other, other non-residential matters. Um, the aforementioned planning application, sir, has been useful um, in that it has flushed out some of the detailed comments. Um, there are no objections from the Environment Agency or Natural England in relation to flooding and the relationship of the site to the river belts. Um, the Parish Council are correct that the, the flooding on Moat Road is a combination of the, 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 two, war, the two streams coming together at that point. Um, the County Council as local lead flood authority also have no objection in principle on grounds of flooding. Um, like their highway colleagues, they do ask for a few more detailed modelling questions on how hard surface areas will be managed. But again, they raise no objection in terms of the suitability of the site due to flooding or its impact on flood waters elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, finally, any further points people wish to raise in relation to this particular site, Site 310, uh, its potential deliverability or suitability for development? In terms of its likely delivery um, and capacity, I uh, <coughs> obviously note the Council uh, is clarifying that it's approximately 110 dwellings. I don't know if it's uh, either Mr Mackey or and, and or Ms Smith to advise me in terms of how the Council anticipates or when the Council anticipates this site coming forward. And the, Again, I'll let my colleague come on the specific tra uh, trajectories in a moment, but sir, I think we've, we've looked quite a lot at the potential constraints of the site. In terms of one of the reasons why this site was selected is that it's a generous area of land in relation to the amount of development proposed. It therefore means that we can secure significant levels of public open space, biodiversity net gain, and importantly, the screening that you would need on the western side of the site, because that's the boundary with the new boundary of the village to the countryside. Um, so unlike smaller sites, where it's always difficult to get significant levels of broader public open space, you tend to get just the children's play or some small amenity space. This site does offer the opportunity to create a, a good quality landscape-led development, and that was one of the reasons why you know, we worked at the potential constraints identified in the SLA. So in terms of capacity, um, similar words this morning, we're very comfortable with 110. Um, we think that is definitely achievable. I've seen drawings up to, I think, about 136 that would have needed some finessing. But again, I think it would be for the development management process and my colleagues to test the quality of the layout and the landscaping to determine whether you could get more than 110. So just to follow up on the trajectory point, we would be, um, we've modelled it to start delivering in 2025, 26, over three years. Thank you. If there are no further points then in relation to Headcorn, can I thank everybody for their um, contributions um, this afternoon? I note the council is going to modify the plan so we've got consistent spelling on moat as part of this 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 policy. That's that's minor uh, a minor change for the council um, to make, uh, and certainly the one identifiable action is for the council to consider the wording of that proposed main, main modifications uh, to the policy in relation to access. 
Okay, that concludes uh, this afternoon's hearings and the hearings um, for this week. We reconvene back in this room, I think, next Tuesday uh, for a further week's uh, week's worth of, of hearings. I'll see the, certainly the council's team and probably others uh, next week. Thank you.